Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Don Walker and I'm the Communications Director for Brevard County Emergency Management. Brevard County Emergency Management's foremost priority is the safety of Brevard County residents. And in that regard, we have closely, we are closely monitoring the alarming uptick in COVID-19 cases in our county. We are working very closely with our local healthcare agencies and the Florida Department of Health Brevard. And we are holding this video press conference today in an effort to keep our community informed. Currently, the county is focusing on sharing the importance of getting vaccinated and for following CDC recommendations to, to protect yourself from contracting this potentially fatal virus. Vaccine is readily available in our county and it is recommended that anyone ages 12 and older get vaccinated, whether it's through your personal physician, an urgent care, a local pharmacy, or Department of Health Brevard clinics in Vieira, Melbourne, and Titusville. Now I'm going to ask Barry Inman, who's the epidemiologist with DOH Brevard, to provide us with an update and hopefully shed some light on what's happening in Brevard County that's caused this spike in COVID cases. Dr. Inman, if you would, please. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Don. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, currently we have uh, over 46,000 cases, you know, from when um, this pandemic began, we're approaching a thousand deaths of this uh, virus, and um, we are seeing a, a quite an uptick uh, in our cases, of course. And to give you an example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had 700 and, and uh, just over 700 uh, cases for the week. Last week, we had over 1,500. And so far this week, we have 2,500. So there's no doubt uh, that we're gonna double our cases uh, from, uh, from last, last week, uh, unfortunately with this, uh, with this virus. Um, so far as the transmission goes um, and what's fueling it, uh, probably a few indicators. One, um, which you already mentioned, is that uh, we do need more people vaccinated. We have just over 50% of the uh, population uh, that is fully vaccinated. Um, and so, uh, and of course with this Delta variant, which without a doubt we have it here, every specimen that we have sent up, um, such, uh, such as like we've had in outbreaks or severe cases uh, in the community um, <clears throat> or deaths, uh, they have come back positive for the Delta variant. Um, and of course this Delta variant is a, hundred times more infectious than any other variant that uh, we've had in the past. And uh, to give it in, put it in perspective with, with the initial wild virus that we had um, when the virus first came into our community, the uh, reproductive ratio or RO ratio was about uh, two or three. You, that is you would infect two or three people. Um, with this uh, uh, Delta variant, it has moved to five to eight. Uh, that's getting uh, fairly close to the reproductive ratio of measles, which can be you know, anywhere from uh, 10 to about 18 or so people that can be infected. And measles is extremely infectious. It's the most in, uh, infectious organism we have on this planet. Um, and of course, uh, with people uh, not wearing masks as readily as we once wore, that is, that is transmitting it. Uh, people getting in large groups of uh, gatherings and what have you, uh, transmitting it. We are having outbreaks, uh, particularly in our camps with our children. Uh, and there are all sorts of camps that we've seen with that. Our daycare centers, we have seen uh, <clears throat> outbreaks, of course, with that. Uh, our long-term care facilities, uh, although most of them have done uh, fairly well, we have had, had some uh, that have had uh, outbreaks, of course, uh, uh, and attack rates of 20 to 30 uh, percent. We do see people who are uh, uh, vaccinated uh, but become infected, but generally we find that uh, they're not hospitalized and they certainly don't expire uh, from, this, uh, from this virus. Um, so there's probably been a, a little, little bit of, uh, of, of our letting our guard down in the, in the community. Unfortunately, 
Uh, and uh, certainly, but our, our biggest uh, uh, concern, of course, is that we just don't have enough people vaccinated to thwart uh, this, uh, this ongoing pandemic. My apologies. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I started. What I was trying to say after uh, Dr. Inman spoke was that we will open the floor for questions from the media once we do briefings from all the uh, uh, panelists on board today with us. Uh, one of the things that we're noticing from a county standpoint that uh, has been acknowledged by our fire chief is that the number of daily transports uh, of patients with COVID related symptoms to area hospitals is uh, back at the peak levels it was during the peak of the pandemic earlier on. So we're looking at roughly a dozen of those transports a day. And what they're finding when they get to hospitals are crowded emergency rooms. So we have invited all uh, uh, representatives from all of the area hospitals to be on the uh, panel today. And we're gonna start off with just an update of what's happening at Parish Hospital uh, from uh, Edwin Lofton who is their senior vice president and chief nursing officer. Uh, Edwin, what can you tell us of what you're seeing at Parish Hospital and what do you think it's gonna be looking like moving forward as far as um, the impact it's gonna have on your staffing and also your hospital as a, as a whole? Well, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and let me start off with saying that, <clears throat> again, all three systems have been coordinating and working uh, all three hospitals have a daily call at this point in time in which we cooperate to make sure that we've got the resources and the flexibility to meet the needs of the entire county. Uh, Parish Medical Center in the north part of the county, uh, like every other hospital, has seen a significant uh, surge uh, in COVID cases. Uh, for example, on June 19th, we had two patients in house with COVID-19, and we're actually looking at planning a zero party, a zero patient party. Well, fast forward to June 29th, and today we have 46 uh, patients with COVID in-house, six of those in the ICU and the rest in the med surge area. Uh, this is almost twice as many as we had at the peak in July of 2020. Um, of those patients, 96 of them are completely unvaccinated. Uh, so back to uh, various comments and your comments early on, the impact of vaccination is significant. Um, Parish Medical Center, is um, providing the, the resources needed to take care of these patients. We have flex staffing. Uh, we have taken a couple of uh, significant um, actions, including stopping elective surgeries so that we can use those resources, those nurses uh, and assistive staff uh, at the bedside. Uh, we're meeting the needs of the patients. Uh, we, like you said, Don, have had a um, large volume of patients uh, in the ED. We are managing those patients moving through we're making sure we get a triage done early and often uh, and are looking at making sure that uh, whatever the community presents and needs, we, we will do. We're also in the middle of moving our vaccination clinic, which has been in our <coughs> facility on Highway 50 for the past several months to our uh, South End parking lot uh, effective today. We're actually erecting a tent today um, so that we can do both uh, acute care, vaccinations and testings all at our uh, North Washington location. Hi, Edwin. Thank you very much. And uh, I know they're seeing similar things uh, at Health First. And we've got Dr. Jeffrey Stallnaker on the line with us today. Dr. Stallnaker, what, what's the situation there at Health First? And uh, what impact is that having on your staff? And, and what types of steps is Health First taking uh, in regard to the, all that? Uh, thanks, Don. And uh, we, we had to just uh, move a little bit. Uh, we got a fire alarm going off. So but we're not ready to evacuate yet. Uh, we found a little quieter place. Um, well, first of all, it's just great to see my colleagues on the call and just know that, you know, we certainly appreciate all the great work um, you're doing as well. So our experience at Health First is similar. Uh, after the New Year's holidays, our highest average, day, uh, average daily census hit uh, 111. Uh, this morning, we're at 172. So we've seen the same dramatic increase over the, over the last few weeks. Um, so our, we're sort of in that disaster planning mode as well, identifying uh, space and so on, looking at some of the models, it would appear that we're going to be in this at least uh, well into August. 
So uh, we're putting contingencies in place to, uh, to be able to manage that. And again, we're finding the same thing. These are basically uh, unvaccinated individuals. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Spellnaker. And uh, on that note too, we'll move over to Stewart Hospital uh, for an update from Dr. Nick Moratti uh, about what the conditions are there, doctor. Hey, well, good morning, everybody. I uh, appreciate you having me. And again, appreciate a lot of uh, familiar faces coming together so that we can kind of share and communicate. Um, we're kind of seeing the same thing at our three steward facilities in the area. Uh, there's been an increase in volume really all across the board. In addition to COVID, there's been an increase in non-COVID volume, which puts a little bit more strain on all of the resources of the community. Um, we also have seen about 98 to 99% non-vaccinated uh, rate among our, our patients admitted with COVID-related mm -hmm. illness and disease. Um, it's been kind of great to work among the three different steward facilities because the way that we've addressed it, as always, is we kind of pull resources, um, send the resources to where they're most needed in real time. You know, the, the census is at each site kind of change throughout the day. And it's been great to work with partners in the community, uh, such as Health First. Um, at uh, my site at Melbourne Regional Medical Center. Uh, in addition to working with the other steward sites, we also work very closely with Holmes Regional Medical Center because we serve uh, kind of a close uh, demographic together. And it's just great to see the community come together to try to address this. Uh, our rates are way up. We have been uh, able to address it well thus far. Uh, we also project it to be continuing like this for some while. So um, we're batting down the hatches and uh, ready to continue to address this storm. Thank you very much. So I, I you know, I wanted to, uh, initially we were going to do this as a Facebook Live, but uh, because of the rising numbers of COVID, we decided that it might be best because we wanted the hospital's involvement to do it as a Zoom call where we could all be here with, and, and be in our own respective areas. Uh, but I did invite all the media out today because I know they've got a lot of questions. They pose a lot of questions at me and, and I'm one of those stay in your lane folks. So when they ask me hospital questions, I don't even begin to try to answer those. So I'm going to open up the floor uh, for questions from the media. Uh, members of the media, if you would identify who you are and what your uh, respective uh, news agency is, when you ask your question, I would greatly appreciate it. And we'll get that started now. So if you have a question, uh, if you want to direct it at anyone in particular, uh, that might be best just so we don't have at once, uh, but please go ahead, first one. All right, I'll go first then. Um, Don, this one's for you. Uh, is the county doing anything to incentivize or, or try to get people to get vaccinated who aren't otherwise? Because it does seem like this is primarily hitting the unvaccinated um, population right now. Okay, sure. Uh, and since you didn't do it, I'll identify. This is Tyler Vasquez from Florida today. So Tyler, what the county's doing uh, starting uh, early last week, I began putting out daily press releases, uh, encouraging people to get vaccinated and to do so as quickly as possible, uh, to follow the CDC recommendations. Uh, I know emergency very closely, as I said before, with all of our healthcare agencies, and uh, we're monitoring this very closely. And, you know, from what we do from that point, we'll either be directed by actions that are taken by the state or that are directed either from the county manager or from our board of county commissioners. So that's our main uh, goal right now is to help these health organizations as best we can to keep people from going to their hospitals with COVID symptoms because we're getting them out there and getting them vaccinated. Uh, next question, please. This is Dave Berman at Florida Today. Um, I want to ask if um, any of the hospital officials or the health department feels that um, other measures should be put in place by county government or city government to um, kind of stop the um, spread of virus as far as um, masking policies, which some other counties and cities have been looking at or any other guidelines related to social distancing other than what's voluntarily in place now. So if uh, anyone wants to speak up from the uh, hospitals, otherwise I'll, I'll pick somebody just to keep everybody from talking over each other. 
about I wouldn't Dr. mind addressing a part of that, uh, if you that's okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sure. So I think that the policies that are in place are good ones. I, I think that a lot of us have noticed, let's say we go shopping Publix or somewhere, uh, it's clearly stated with signs on the doors that say, if fully vaccinated, masks are voluntary. If not fully va vaccinated, masks are mandatory. And yet when we look around, maybe one, two percent of people are wearing masks, but only 50 percent are vaccinated. Well, to me, those numbers don't add up. So some people aren't playing by the rules, and that might be partially contributing to the breakout we have. Um, kind of touching on Dave's point and um, back to what Don said earlier, how would the group here feel about maybe taking some questions from the community that we could all address? Because I've noticed there's a lot of misinformation out there um, everywhere in the community in terms of what the vaccination is, what it means, what are the actual side effects, what are the dangers, things like that. I'm just wondering if uh, people could submit questions where we could answer it in kind of like a town hall style thing or something with pre-recorded questions. Um, maybe education of the community would be the key to improving the vaccination rate. Sure, and uh, Dr. Moradi, I mean, it really plays right into what we're going to do with this. Uh, my goal after this, this event is concluded is we will get this posted on social media and we will be entertaining questions from the public, because we do want them to be able to ask their questions. And that's another reason uh, that I'm going to announce later that we're gonna be re-implementing our weekly Facebook Live events where we would provide updates to the community on where we stood as far as uh, events occurring during the pandemic peak. Uh, but yes, we will be posting this on social media today. We are going to entertain questions from the public. And once those questions are received, we will be reaching out to uh, you and others in the medical community to get those questions answered. And that way they, we, you know, we are going to, do our, going to do our best to get that information out there because we know there are a lot of questions. The reason I invited all the local media here is because I felt under this platform of doing a video press conference that they would help us best spread the message quicker and faster than if we just did this and posted it ourselves and didn't entertain any questions from anybody. So that's why we're doing this today, but that is an excellent suggestion and one that we've anticipated uh, that we would need to pursue moving forward. So thank you very much. All right, any other uh, questions from the media, please speak up. This is Mel Holt with WFTV. And it sounds like from uh, what you all have said that you are seeing higher numbers, if, if not the same numbers we saw at our previous peak in terms of your COVID cases. I'd really like to know how you're doing, and this is to each of the hospital systems, how you're doing in terms of your bed capacity right now. I know that obviously there's been some delay of elective surgeries. I saw the tents outside of the tent outside of homes yesterday, but how are you doing in terms of your capacity? How much room is left here? So, so Mel, I'll, I'll take the first one. It's from Health First. Um, for us, it's probably more of a staffing issue than a bed issue. I mean, across our IDM, we do have the ability to flex quite a bit, uh, tie it on traditional ICU beds. But again, um, that's more of a staffing issue, and we're able to to flex other beds to meet uh, the needs of critical care patients. But along with those beds, you have to have the folks to uh, you know to take care of the patients and. You know, this has gone on for over a year and people are tired and and there's a lot of um, uh, folks that are moving around really across the country uh, taking per diem positions and so on so um, I think pretty much across central Florida and I think my our uh, other healthcare care uh, colleagues here are, are facing the same issue with staffing all right very good uh, any other questions from the media please speak up Hey, Don, Greg Pillow, News 13. Okay. Uh, and this uh, can be for uh, uh, anyone on here. Um, we, we've talked about the, the cases going up, the positive cases. Um, what are the numbers right now as far as the death rate here in our community? Uh, that sounds like a question for uh, Barry Inman. The, the, the death rate is right at about uh, 2%. Now, you know, compare that to the flu, uh, which is 0.01%. Um, so uh, it's, this is very, very significant. Then again, our deaths are mostly, uh, far mostly, 
occurring among those people that are not vaccinated. Yeah, Thank Greg, you, Dr. Uh, I, Greg, I, good, Donna, I just had a quick follow-up for him, if I could. Go ahead. Uh, it, it, do you have, uh, Doctor, do you have numbers on that as far as how many deaths have, have taken place? And, and I don't know what, what date you would start from, maybe essentially when cases started going up. Do you have the number of deaths uh, that have happened in that period of time? Uh, you mean during the surge? We, yeah, we, uh, when, yeah, whenever that milestone began or whenever that marker began and then uh, until today. Well, as I said, we're approaching a thousand deaths uh, early on. Uh, with that, uh, I don't. We're not seeing an increase in the death rate. We're actually seeing somewhat of a, de uh, a, uh, a decrease, uh, particularly uh, from a couple uh, months ago. Uh, with that, and th and that's due, of course, the hospitals are doing their uh, treatment therapies, of course, that they do, um, and what have you. With that, so that's helping a, a good bit. Uh, and of course, if the patients get to the facility early enough. Uh, there's other therapies that, of course, that they can they can uh, utilize. Uh, but we, you know, we were decreasing in quite quite a bit in June. We're seeing an uptick, but uh, believe believe, and, and of course that uh, the other physicians, of course, can speak uh, in, uh, into this. But probably we're seeing somewhat uh, not an increase in deaths necessarily with that because of the people vaccinated. You know, we didn't have uh, at least 50 percent of people vaccinated. Uh, we might be seeing an increase and uh, the, the deaths that may be occurring there. Thank you. All right, is it, did anybody else wanna to add to that? Otherwise we'll move on to the next question. Don, I, I would just make the comment too. Remember deaths are a lagging indicator. Um, younger group that are being infected, so they are generally doing better, but I think we're yet to see uh, as the surge goes on and we start moving toward the peak, I think we're yet to see uh, what the mortality is going to be. And, and Don, to further what Dr. Stonebaker said <clears throat> in reference, yes, we are definitely seeing a younger population uh, in, in July of 2020. Our average age was around 65. Right now, the median age for the patients at Parish Medical Center is 55. So we're, we've seen a dramatic uh, decrease in age. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, any I, other Don, if it's okay, I'd like to add one point as well, just that we're kind of seeing the same thing, but I will point out that when we compare this surge to the initial surge a year ago, we actually have better treatments and therapies now and more evidence behind those therapies. So in a lot of different ways, we're in a better place than we were a year ago to handle the surge. I agree. Okay, excellent point. All right, uh, any other questions from the media? Please speak up. Um, yes, Don, this is... Uh, go ahead. This is uh, John Shabon with us, Spectrum News 13. Yes, I had a I had a question for the for the hospitals. Um, considering the the, the fast uptick um, and the cases that we're seeing, um, I'm hoping that maybe the hospitals can speak about um, the PPEs. Um, are, how are they doing, um, you know, supply wise, and is there a concern um, for the future? Don, I'll be glad to take that as a start. Really? At Parish, one of the things that we did early on uh, in 2020 is we set a goal of having 365 days worth of PPE on hand, and we were able to achieve that uh, back in the fall of last year. So now as we go through the surge, uh, we, are, we are well prepared. Um, we have ample PPE for all of our care partners, all of our providers, uh, and for family members and, and patients. So um, we believe that we're prepared, we thought ahead, um, and maybe it's luck, but Lucky's better than good some days. All right, very good. Dr. Moradi, what's the situation at Stewart? Kind of a similar situation. You know, we have 44 hospitals across our network. We also stored up to prepare uh, just in case there was another surge such as this. And fortunately, we live in this wonderful capitalistic country. So when, we, when the production of masks started to ramp up during the last surge about a year ago, there seemed to be a great amount of uh, availability for the PPE for really all health systems to store up. And Stuart definitely took, uh, took that opportunity to store up to be prepared. All right, and Dr. Stallnaker, any uh, input from you on that? It, we did the same thing. When, when things let off a little bit and the supply chain opened up, we took that opportunity to increase our number of days on hand. 
Um, the only thing about days on hand is it's a number based on where you were at the time. When the numbers go up, uh, the number of days on hand <laughs> go down, but we, we feel pretty good um, the, uh, around PPE. Uh, and Dr. Inman, too, I know FDOH is very much involved in this, obviously. Where, where do you guys stand on PPE supplies? Um, well, generally, the community is in pretty good shape. Our, our long-term care facilities and, uh, and other facilities we deal with, and, and, and us here, of course, here at the health department, uh, we seem to have ample supplies. So there doesn't seem to be, it, it's, rare, it's rare that we see uh, anyone lacking uh, in PPEs. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, anybody else with a question from the media? Uh, I do have another question. This is Mel Holt again, uh, Don. Uh, this question may be to Barry Inman or anyone else who cares to answer. Uh, Brevard County, like a lot of school districts right now, is mask optional. And uh, a matter of days, uh, school uh, will be resuming. And of course, it's, it's during a surge. Uh, I know there will be a discussion tonight uh, among the school board, but how concerned should parents be at this time? Because at, at this point, children 12 and under cannot be vaccinated. Uh, as they return to school? Uh, well, I'll leave, but I certainly hope the, uh, the, the other hospitals will, will tune into this also. Um, but, you know, whenever you have uh, people gathering uh, and when you have as transmissible a virus as this is, uh, there's a lot of fertile ground for this uh, virus to, uh, uh, to tra transmit. Now, CDC, CDC did do a study back uh, you know, some months ago and showed that there was really not much difference between uh, the children acquiring this uh, in the community <clears throat> versus the school. Uh, the thing that concerns me some is that, of course, that was not dealing with the Delta variant. Uh, now we're dealing with the Delta variant uh, with that. So uh, one thing, the health department is going to be monitoring this extremely closely. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> quite a number of employees that will be working uh, with the uh, school board, and of course, we'll be identifying patient, uh, you know, uh, children, uh, and of course, if they're infected, then of course they have to stay out. Uh, generally, ten days in most cases. With that, uh, we will be uh, 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 quarantining. So, if anybody uh, <clears throat> comes in contact uh, with a child, or even a faculty member, or what have you, or whatever, uh, with that, then of course they'll be quarantined uh, with that. Uh, we try to be monitoring the children more closely. Uh, alcohol hand rinse, of course, that will be wide available. Uh, the school boards are getting some funding to uh, do some ventilation as assessments and maybe uh, some maybe some of the older school uh, augment some of those so you may have less uh, <clears throat> uh, aerosol transmission uh, of the virus. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the media? Um, this is Dave Berman of Florida Today. Um, I had a question about the um, restart of cruising at Port Canaveral, um, kind of two areas of that. Um, is anybody um, would um, like to address whether there's concern about all these tourists coming in from out of town for these cruises, and also a concern about how safe are the ships for people going on the cruises? Um, where there's thousands of people in a confined area now. Don, I'll, I'll speak up to this one. <clears throat> uh, Dave, uh, Parish Medical Center has had the privilege and the honor of partnering with uh, Port Canaveral and the multitude of cruise lines. We have been providing the uh, vaccinations to the cruise line crews uh, for well over three months now. I think we provided over 8,000 uh, vaccines in the arms of the, crew, of the um, cruise crews. Uh, over time, the cruise lines are taking this very seriously. They are, as, as you've seen, as you all have reported on, they've done their test cruises, they're creating the safest environment that they can. And again, and, and I know Stuart and the Health First are on board, we're here to support our community and the economic uh, return in a safe, appropriate manner. All right, thank you. Anybody else want to address that or we'll move on to the next question? I might lend a small point to that. It's Totally agree with what uh, Edwin had said. Um, a part of the question seemed to be, what do we think about that increased uh, visitor population coming from out of state into state just for the cruise lines? But I will say what we've seen, as I, as I alluded to earlier, was an increase in volume overall. 
And I think a part of that is due to increasing population size of Florida overall. What we've noticed is a lot of winter birds that usually come for the winter and then start or to head back to other states in the spring have decided to stay in Florida. And we're also having a lot of other people moving to Florida that I think is higher than normal for uh, this time of year. So I think we're already seeing that bump in volume. I don't know that the cruise ship industry uh, is a big enough percentage to uh, make it a no noticeable difference for us at the hospital level. All right, thank you. I think we'll entertain maybe one or two more questions and uh, we'll wrap it up at that point. Anybody in the media have any additional questions? Yeah, I have one. This is Tyler with Florida Today again. Um, and this is for Barry and Min, but for also any of the physicians who might want to chime in. Um, a lot of the framing of the current surge of, around the country is that it is in just what the doctors have said, it is a surge of unvaccinated people. but as we've seen with the Delta variants and even some other variants, how soon could this become an issue even for vaccinated people if, if more variants are able to breed in the community and, and you know more easily break through that vaccine? Um, well, <clears throat> uh, that's gonna be a concern uh, because if we don't have more people vaccinated, then the virus can continue to replicate and replicate um, and it's going to get more efficient at, in, at attaching to our cells, our respiratory cells, and, and other cells for that matter in our body. Um, so that, that's a concern. Um, and also, you know, we have to be cognizant that uh, uh, this is a small world. And I think in the world, we have just over 1 billion people that may be vaccinated. There's 7 billion on this planet. Um, so we, we've got a large task in front of us. However, uh, you know, we have seen um, some communities uh, up north, particularly that they have a high vaccination rate uh, of their communities, and there's little or no, you know, uh, uh, virus coming in. So the best, the best thing we can do uh, to try to reduce the onset of, of, of other variants is to, of course, get vaccinated. And of course, that's what we've done with other diseases um, also that we deal with. All right. Did anybody else want to address that before I go to the next question? Can I Barry, uh, so <clears throat> rephrase a little? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to slightly rephrase what Barry was saying for uh, the viewers out there. Um, the way that a virus or a bacterial infection can work is if you partially treat it, that increases the chance of your resistance. So if you think of it as us fighting the virus or us fighting some kind of bacterial infection, if you partially treat, same way if you partially immunize, I think it leads to more variants that are more deadly, that can harm us more. And I think that's where Barry was going with, uh, the more we get vaccinated, the less likely it is for these nasty variants to pop up. Is that, uh, is that what you were going for, Barry? Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for your help. I would agree with both of my colleagues uh, put it well. Um, it, it has to grow to mutate. And so um, when you have unvaccinated individuals, you get the opportunity for the virus to expand and, and that's when it mutates. All right, thank you, Dr. Stallmaker. I, uh, we'll take one more question uh, before we wrap it up. So who's got one? All right, nobody with a question? What's for lunch? There you go. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Stallnaker, uh, Edwin Lofton, Dr. Marathi, and Barry Eman, thank you all very, very much for being uh, on our panel today. Uh, I think we're able to get a lot of information out there that people need to hear. Uh, I know we answered some questions that the media uh, has uh, needed answers to, so I thank you for that. I do want to re uh, uh, reiterate that uh, we are going to re-implement our Facebook Live COVID-19 updates starting next Thursday, we'll be holding those on a weekly basis. And I'm sorry, we may be actually holding those on Friday. So it's kind of still in flux, but look for it either at 11.30 next Thursday or 11.30 next Friday. I will send out a press release to let you know that we're holding that. Uh, we plan on broadening our panel uh, in the future to include other experts like we had on the panel today. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to end this uh, video conference by imploring anyone who's watching this that hasn't been vaccinated 
to do yourself and your loved ones a favor by getting vaccinated as soon as possible, uh, not only for your own personal safety, but also for the safety of your loved ones and others in our community. So thank you for joining us today and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.